focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, uh, joining us in the studio, we have our Wednesday reporters in Handan and Yoon Hae-jung. Guys, welcome back. Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening to you. For a change, we're going to start things off with some very positive news here. Uh, we did kind of briefly preview uh, what was happening. Uh, this is, of course, in regards to South Korea trying to win a seat into the, uh, the UN Security Council as a uh, non-permanent member. Uh, the voting took place at the UN General Assembly at, I believe, around uh, 11 p.m. Korea Standard Time. Uh, we were hoping for some good news. Well, we got the good news. Uh, South Korea finally uh, winning that non-permanent seat in the UN Security Council, uh, claiming the membership uh, after 11 years. Uh, this is the second time around. So, Tan, you're going to start us off. Uh, give us the details of this good news. Sure. South Korea was elected as a non-permanent member of the UNSC for a two-year term, gaining momentum to make a louder voice when addressing North Korea issues and other regional security challenges on the global stage. As the only candidate nation in Asia, Seoul was chosen in a vote at the UN General Assembly in New York, garnering 180 votes among 192 member states during the assembly. This marks Korea's return to the UN body in 11 years after last sitting on the council from 2013 to 14. And this uh, also marks the third time for South Korea to serve as one of the 10 non-permanent UNSC members. It previously served in the seat during the 1996 to 1997 term. Seoul's Foreign Ministry welcomed the results, vowing efforts to play a leading role in various issues, encompassing those related to security, peacekeeping, women, and emerging threats such as cybersecurity and climate change. The ministry said that as a country directly involved in the Korean Peninsula issue, Korea will actively contribute to UNSC efforts to address the threat posed by North Korea's nuclear development. It added that South Korea has a strong commitment to joining UN efforts and maintaining maintaining international peace and security as a country that has achieved economic development and dem democratization through assistance from the UN and the global community. South Korean Ambassador to the UN Hwang jun Guk echoed the ministry's remarks, saying Korea will do its best to contribute to world peace, freedom and prosperity through diplomacy based on universal values, the principles of the UN Charter and by expanding cooperation with developing countries. The UNSC is is the UN's only body that can make legally binding decisions, such as imposing sanctions. It consists of five permanent members, the US, China, Russia, France, and the UK, and 10 non-permanent members of two-year terms. The current non-permanent members include Switzerland, Ecuador, and Japan. Along with Korea, four other non-permanent members were elected this time around who will replace seats occupied by Albania, Brazil, Gabon, Ghana, and the UAE starting January next year. South Korea is likely to assume the presidency of the council in June next year, according to a foreign ministry official. Each of the UNSC members uh, takes up the presidency for one month uh, in the alphabetical order of the country. Yeah, I just want to make a correction on my uh, that uh, I made here. I said the second time around, it was the third time around, like uh, Tan said. And of course, uh, yesterday we had a chance uh, to talk to the former South Korean ambassador to the United Nations uh, in Ojun uh, when he was actually uh, in part of the, uh, the had held that uh, position from 2013 to 2014. We also uh, talked about that uh, ever so famous speech uh, he made at the UN Security Council in regards to human rights uh, violations in North Korea that had, to, you know, as we say back then, it went viral at the time and it was a smash hit. And uh, we were, uh, I guess, lucky enough uh, to have a chance to speak to him in yesterday's program. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is certainly very good news. And I think it's uh, rightfully so that South Korea does get the uh, non-permanent membership uh, into the new uh, UN Security Council uh, as North Korea issue is I mean, that is one of the bigger issues right now at this time. And so we're going to talk about what kind of significance this holds for South Korea and some of the changes 
that we can expect with South Korea now having the membership. Hejung, you have more on this. Well, for starters, Korea becoming a non-permanent member will give a further boost to the trilateral efforts of Korea, the U.S., and Japan to respond to North Korea's nuclear and missile provocations. And as Korea has seized the opportunity to take a leading role in the Security Council, some say it is the best opportunity to carry out value diplomacy emphasized by the current Yoon administration. One of the greatest benefits of being a member of the Security Council is the ability to participate in all meetings of the council, including formal meetings, consultations, and supplementary informal discussions, and to have their voices actively heard in the process of crafting the council's substantive outcomes, such as resolutions. And most importantly, starting next year, Korea will be able to take the lead in drafting resolutions and presidential statements regarding the Korean peninsula, and we will be able to clearly emphasize the illegality of North Korea's armed provocations. Previously, as Korea was not a member of the Security Council, it has only participated in meetings on North Korean provocations as a stakeholder. As a stakeholder, South Korea has been limited to participating in only a few public meetings, such as the debate. And during the campaign for a non-permanent seat, Seoul presented pledges centered around peacekeeping operations, contribution to women and peace and security, cybersecurity contributions, and efforts in tackling climate change, as Town mentioned for us. And while fulfilling these pledges, the government is expected to emphasize key principles just such as freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. Now, we've talked about, again, I mean, it is great news that South Korea is now, uh, once again, uh, for the first time in 11 years, a member of the non-permanent member of the UNSC and so forth. But we talk about uh, all these uh, UNSC resolutions that get talked about and eventually get vetoed. All of the, the ones that get vetoed by China and Russia, these are all ones uh, that are, of course, in regards to uh, North Korea. I believe uh, in recent... Uh, was it the, a year ago, I think, or a few a year ago, I believe it was, they tried to uh, slap uh, Russia with some uh, UNSC resolution, but of course China, uh, you know, they, they have the veto power in regards to this. So it is unfortunate that some of these resolutions don't uh, go through, but still uh, South Korea being part of this and being part of the, all these uh, discussions that take place at the UNSC, it is uh, very notable here. And uh, speaking of North Korea, made uh, growing calls to further beef up U.S. deterrence to protect South Korea from uh, intensifying North Korea threats. We have Seoul and Washington having agreed to expand the scope of intelligence uh, about uh, North Korean missile launches that they share in, in near real time. Uh, and they plan to do so using space-based early warning system is what they're saying. Uh, Tan, you're going to tell us more about this. Right. The Space Command of United States Forces Korea, or USFK, will be tasked with sharing information from the U.S. military's reconnaissance satellites with South Korea and Japan to heighten missile defense cooperation against the unprecedented levels of missile threat from North Korea. A USFK spokesperson told Radio Free Asia that the U.S. Space Forces Korea, known as Space Force Corps, within the U.S. military will be charged with operating a shared early warning system, or SUS. The warning system is based on space-based infrared detection technology mounted on advanced U.S. military spy satellites. The space-based infrared system, or SPURS, designed to detect missiles, is the backbone of the U.S. early warning system. SPURS satellites are calibrated to spot the intense infrared signatures generated by the fiery plumes of boosting missile stages of all ranges, allowing for the prompt detection of launches tens of seconds after engine ignition. SPURS is instrumental for the U.S. in understanding and assessing the use of missiles in testing, exercises, and war worldwide. Uh, the system-derived data has been critical to Washington's own situational awareness efforts in Europe in the past year. Uh, but due to cost and complexity, and also fears over North Korea's enhancing levels of cyber uh, hack the Spurs had not been shared with South Korea and Japan in the past. Mm -hmm. The two countries, uh, both of whom relied entirely on land and sea.
sea-based radars supplemented just by other limited forms of collection, which wasn't, uh, of course, enough to track and detect missiles launched near their territories. Uh, While both countries are yet to deploy new military reconnaissance satellites uh, and neither plans to employ a persistent space-based missile warning capability, uh, and so official sharing of the SPURS system is expected to bolster allied reassurance and potentially mitigate incentives for North Korea to probe the limitations of missile warning capabilities in South Korea and Japan. And it'll, of course, uh, also meaningfully increase the security of both South Korea and Japan while strengthening their trilateral cooperation with the U.S. This uh, move comes as the defense chiefs of Seoul, Washington and Tokyo make bolder moves to enhance trilateral security ties. During their uh, trilateral meeting in Singapore over the weekend, the defense chiefs agreed to activate a data sharing mechanism to exchange real-time missile warning data before the end of this year. The Pentagon said in a joint statement that the three military leaders, South Korean National Defense Minister Lee jong sop U.S. Secretary of uh, Defense Lloyd Austin, and Japanese Defense Minister Yasukazu Hamada uh, also reaffirmed on the need to cooperate toward the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. That's right. Uh, the, what was it? Uh, I forgot who it was. I think it was the, uh, the U.S. Undersecretary of State, uh, Bonnie Jenkins, who came out on uh, Tuesday saying that, uh, you know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, there is no meaningful dialogue uh, between South Korea, U.S. and North Korea, uh, North Korea right now, ever since the uh, the no deal in Hanoi. Uh, and I believe uh, one of the uh, the reporters had asked her whether or not uh, the U.S. has kind of sort of given up on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, she came out saying, no, it's, it's still not true. Uh, we are still aiming for the denuclearization. I like what she, it's interesting how she put it. She said not the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but the denuclearization of North Korea. Now, remember, mm-hmm. the wording of that is very, very important right. uh, because even here in South Korea, I believe in the defense white paper that was released not too long ago, uh, South Korea Previous and previous administrations, they mentioned the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Right. Mm-hmm. But uh, this time around, under the UN administration, they said the denuclearization of North Korea, mm-hmm. uh, which, I mean, we've talked about whether or not South Korea themselves, uh, us, we're going to have our own nuclear weapons. Maybe that's the case. But uh, it seems like Washington's still very much keen on the, uh, the denuclearization of uh, the Korean Peninsula and maybe a more leading towards uh, North Korea there. Uh, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, this this is an interesting one. I don't know how I feel about this. Uh, last week, we had some reports here. Uh, former U.S. President Donald Trump um, sent a public congratulatory message to none other than his, because remember, they're good friends, right? Uh, <laughs> North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, uh, as North Korea was appointed to the board of the World Health Organization, Obviously, in response to this, we had several Republican presidential candidates who criticized uh, Donald Trump for this. Uh, Tell us more about this. Right. So Donald Trump posted a message of support for Kim Jong-un to his Truth Social site last Saturday after North Korea was appointed to the board of the WHO. Trump wrote congratulations to Kim Jong-un and posted a link to an article about the appointment to the WHO, which is an agency of the UN. Now, the Republican Party have criticized Trump's move as being inappropriate as he is a frontrunner in the 2024 Republican presidential nomination. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp tweeted, Taking our country back from Joe Biden does not start with congratulating North Korea's murderous dictator. And Republican presidential candidates who are competing with Trump for the 2024 nomination have also took aim at the former leader. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is expected to be Trump's closest rival for the GOP nomination, said he was surprised Trump had praised a murderous dictator. And former Vice President Mike Pence and Nikki Haley former governor of South Carolina also criticized Trump saying that nobody should be praising the dictator in North Korea who is simply a threat. And Michael McCall, the House Foreign Affairs Committee chairman added, quote unquote North Korea's election of the WHO executive board is yet another example of the Communist Party's influence at the WHO and the organization's failure to uphold its own policies and standards of good governance. You know, this is 
so interesting because N- Nikki Haley also she is uh, the former U.S. ambassador to the United right. Nations, right? But Mike Pence is interesting, right? So Mike Pence also criticized Trump, and there is a reason for why Mike Pence. Uh, is criticizing Trump despite the fact that he was the vice president uh, when uh, Trump held the, uh, the 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 office is because Mike Pence announced not too long ago I think it was yesterday that he is going to be running for the 2024 presidential race and so it looks like if if Donald, we know Donald Trump is running for this right and there's a whole mm-hmm. bunch of people who are actually running against Donald Trump there's a bunch of Republicans who are going I mean look what happened in the last time uh, you know he couldn't even hold uh, two consecutive uh, terms in office, and so you know, Ron DeSantis might be the front runner uh, in the, the the Republican side, but also now Mike Pence is going after this, and so you're gonna you're gonna see former uh, running mates uh, going up against each other, and boy, it is gonna get interesting. You, you love it when Trump goes off and uh, start dissing everybody, and uh, disobedient speech. But yes, that was my impression of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Let's move on here amid concerns and protests, especially from neighboring countries like us here in South Korea. Uh, Japan is inching towards its final preparations of its uh, planned discharge of nuclear wastewater, which it says will begin this summer. Remember, it was supposed to happen in spring, uh, but they decided to do this after the G7 summit over in Hiroshima for some reason. Uh, Tana, what's the latest on this? Well, it looks like the D-Day is approaching fast. According to public broadcaster NHK, Tokyo Electric Power Company began sending seawater into an underwater tunnel that has been built to release Fukushima nuclear contaminated water into the sea. TEPCO says some 6,000 tons of seawater has now filled the tunnel, which will guide contaminated water from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi power plant to a point about one kilometer offshore. The company says the whole uh, release system is almost complete, except for a reservoir that will store those contaminated water before its release. It expects all construction work to be completed by the end of this month. Japan believes that discharging the diluted or treated nuclear wastewater one kilometer away from the shores via the underwater tunnel will be effective in further diluting tritium, a radioactive material, uh, and also alleviate concerns among fishermen and mitigate damage. Uh, Hejong will have more on this, but uh, the filtered water still contains tritium, and the Japanese government plans to bring the concentration of tritium well below the percentage permitted by national regulations, and also uh, below World Health Organization guidance levels for drinking water quality. Uh, But, of course, concerns remain high here in South Korea among citizens and fishermen alike, and there are still many, many questions that still remain unanswered. The IAEA has uh, completed its uh, last safety inspection recently and is set to announce its final report sometime this month. And Japan is on track to begin the discharge following the release of the report this summer. Yeah, remember, it's not just uh, the South Koreans who are very much against uh, the release of the contaminated water. It's not just China who's uh, against the release of the water. I believe Russia also uh, showed some opposition before all the chaos with the the war in Ukraine. Um, But also the uh, people who work in the fisheries and agriculture industry in Fukushima, right? Because they were saying during the past 10 years, we're trying to improve our image because for the longest time, no one wanted to import their uh, fisheries and agriculture and things like that. And it seems like everything is now fine. And all of a sudden you release this, it is going to impact us. What's also interesting is that even myself, I've only raised concerns over the level of tritium, mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. is in high amounts. It's 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 cancerous. But uh, we had an uh, interview with the uh, nuclear expert. Uh, was it last week or the week before that from New Zealand, who said that the amount of tritium that's going to go in, it's not bad. And also tritium is naturally occurring. But there are other radioactive materials and elements uh, that are going to be released into the waters here. And what's going to be uh, what's going to be impacted by this? Again, the marine fish caught in the nearby harbors of the Fukushima power plant. There's been uh, testing being done before. Uh, it seems like there's a whole lot of rockfish that's always caught off the coast of uh, uh, Fukushima, and they've done another testing in regards to this. 
they found out uh, marine fish caught in the nearby harbor again of the Fukushima power plant far exceeded safety levels for human consumption, which has led to a lot of controversies, obviously. Hejong, you're going to give, the de- uh, give us the details of this. Well, according to a report issued by the plant's operator, TEPCO, not only tritium, but high levels of cesium were detected in rockfish caught in a nearby harbor, which was 180 times that of the standard maximum stipulated in Japan's food safety law. And according to the data, the sampled rockfish contains the radio active element cesium with a content of 1,800 Batgirls per kilogram. So for those who are not familiar, Batgirl is the unit of radioactivity, uh, one Batgirl being one disintegration per second. Now, Japan's current limit of radioactive cesium in general food is set at 100 Batgirls per kilogram. Now, previously in April, 1,200 Batgirls of cesium were detected in a rock trout, which is another type of fish, caught in the same area. And TEPCO explained that the location where the sampled fish was caught is at the port area of units 1 to 4 of the Fukushima nuclear power plant, where a breakwater is built and nuclear wastewater with a high concentration of radioactive substances flows in. And they have said it will set up multiple protective nets to prevent fish from swimming out of the harbor. But even in Japan, people are worried because even if the movement of the contaminated fish is blocked, it's virtually impossible to stop the movement of seawater. But type has not yet come up with any concrete measures. Yeah, uh, I remember it was, I mean, every year they do testing for the, uh, the, the fish off the coast of Fukushima. And I remember, uh, I think it was about, uh, I want to say four years ago, uh, this was before COVID, uh, they caught, again, rockfish off the coast, but it was like far, very far from the coast of uh, Fukushima and they found out that there was again high levels of cesium and it was levels that far succeeded exceeded what was uh, acceptable and so even that right it's not even just like the near the coast of Fukushima uh, and next thing you know I don't know if anyone's seen Simpsons the, the three eye fish blinky uh, we're gonna start seeing that and that it, it's concerning but now what's also happening is if you know things are already expensive price of sea salt is hiking rapidly because now people are going to stockpile sea salt before contaminated water is obviously uh, released. So is this true? And what did the government have to say in regards to this? Well, the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries refuted such claims, saying that it is difficult to say there has been any stockpiling as the sea salt sales has actually decreased. They explained that prices of sea salt has risen as the production of sea salt decreased during rainy days and as producers have adjusted their shipments ahead of the rainy season. The ministry also added that they are planning to step up radiation testing at sea salt production sites amid growing concerns over the safety of domestic sea salt. Yeah, um, probably what's going to happen is that, like, again, I've mentioned this before, but one of my favorite uh, anjus, right, something you eat while you're drinking is raw fish. I love it uh, almost every weekend. And so what happens usually is if you if you buy fish that are naturally caught from the ocean, it's more expensive. Right. right? Mm-hmm. We call it chayun san, right? Uh, right? Right from the. And then there's farmed, uh, which is cheaper. Now they're saying that it's going to be the other way around, where more and more people are mm-hmm. going to seek farmed fish. Mm. Which, by the way, just because it's straight from the ocean doesn't mean it's necessarily more, more tastier or anything like that. But <laughs> we're going to see an uh, increase in prices in the farmed fish is what they're saying at this time. And so there's going to be a big concern because already, uh, you know, the first thing people do when they go to these fish markets to see where the uh, the fish are caught. And uh, now soon enough, of course, there's a lot of people that don't buy any fish from uh, Japan. But now they're saying also anything from the East Coast in the East Sea. Uh, right. From like let's say like Gangneung area and like Busan area, uh, they're saying even like Jeju, uh, they're probably not going to buy it. So it's going to impact all of us. And speaking of which, I mean, again, it, nearly everyone here in South Korea uh, very concerned about the discharge here and the vehemently uh, uh, in, in opposition of all this. But we have to understand that again, the people who are most worried are the people in the fishing industry, right? And so as Japan inches closer to the discharge, we have various fishermen's uh, associations here in South Korea who are moving quickly to mitigate the impact. So Talon, tell us more about this. Well, uh, the Korea Federation of Advanced Fisheries appealed to the public that Korea's fish 
Missouri's products are safe, and so the country should refrain from stirring excessive fear over the consequences of Japan's discharge of nuclear waste water. In a statement issued on Tuesday, members of the Federation stressed that no fishermen should be forced to leave the industry and lose their jobs due to excessive concerns uh, during unprecedentedly difficult times, exacerbated by soaring oil prices and shortage of output in the fishing industry. They said that they share concerns and worries with the people in Korea, but they urged the country to not let concerns escalate into excessive fears over the safety of local fisheries products. They asked uh, to have a keen eye that can discern what's fake news and what's not and help mitigate the impact on the local fishing industry by maintaining a calm and rational stance on the matter. The Federation promised to respond to the planned discharge based on science and keep providing safe seafood to the people. Uh, Meanwhile, Korea is another uh, nationwide union of local fishermen took things to a different level, taking legal action uh, as they strive to mitigate damage. The Korea Coastal Fishermen's Association, the largest organization in Korea with more than 15,000 members nationwide, filed a complaint against Seoul National University professor of nuclear engineering, Seo Gyun-yeol, who has long been voicing strong opposition to the release of contaminated water in Fukushima, Japan. The association submitted a complaint against professor Hall to the Tan police station in Chungcheongnam-do province last week for charges including defamation. Professor Sa voiced negative opinions about the discharge of contaminated water through various media, saying that it takes only five to seven months for the radioactive water to flow into the East Sea, uh, and asserting that if he, uh, if the treated water is clean, Japan wouldn't have to throw them away and instead use it for industrial or agricultural purposes, uh, which proves that the water is radioactive and harmful. The association argued that it is a matter of livelihood for them, but Seoul continues to stir up people's anxiety without proper scientific grounds. It went on to say that they now face a situation where their life uh, depends on unverified remarks made by some experts, and that those remarks will make people more anxious about eating local seafood, which will bring immeasurable losses to local fishermen. The ministry, the ministry of Oceans and Fisheries, also echoed the association's claims. Early urging Professor Hall not to spread one-sided argument. Well, you know, what's interesting is actually Professor Saw joined us in our program oh, uh, really? a few <laughs> months ago. And I do remember what he said. It said five to seven months. But you have to understand what he said. He said there's the deep water contamination and then there's the surface water contamination. The deep water contamination is not so much of a worry for the short term because mm-hmm. that takes longer. And also the way that, according to, again, according to Professor Sa, right? Uh, but it's the surface water that's the big concern. And mm-hmm. it's the surface water where the vast majority of the fish that we take in comes from the surface water area, not the deep ocean. Uh, and so he was saying that the surface water is going to enter uh, into the EC sometime around like five to seven months is exactly what what you just said, Tan, uh, was the big concern. And so at the time, it did seem like he wasn't just kind of like, you know, estimating this or something. I believe he had like a model in place and he said uh, this is, you know, under a, a simulated model that he had conducted and so forth. So, you know, we can't say for sure whether or not he's basing this on, you know, something that he just made up or anything like that. But again, uh, here on Korea Now, uh, we did have an interview, which I thought was uh, quite interesting and uh, interesting that we're talking about him now and this whole complaint that's being uh, made to him. Uh, nevertheless, we'll keep a close tab on this. And uh, it is going to be, again, the, the release is going to come soon. And uh, there's going to be a great deal of opposition. Uh, of course, we had even the the South Korean inspectors, the experts uh, who went into expe- uh, inspect on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, said they might need more information is what they said. And that's not the answer that we wanted, right? We wanted to hear that it was safe and they got transparent information. But uh, looks like uh, before they get any more information, uh, the release of the contaminated water is going to happen nevertheless. Uh, let's move on, talk about the economy. The World Bank on Tuesday revised its outlook for the global economy this year. Uh, warning of sluggish growth in 2023. 
uh, though the report released from the bank did not mention the outlook for South Korea specifically, it did show uh, where the world economy is headed. So, Hejong, you have the uh, the numbers here. Right. So, the World Bank's global economic growth forecast has increased since January, but growth over the rest of 2023 is set to slow substantially as it is weighed down by the lagged and ongoing effects of monetary tightening and more restrictive credit conditions as well as the war in Ukraine. The the World Bank projected that global growth would slow to 2.1% this year from 3.1% in 2022. That is slightly stronger than its forecast of 1.7% in January, but in 2024, the number is now expected to rise to 2.4%. And the World Bank sees widespread slowdowns in advanced economies as well. The growth in advanced economies, including the U.S., U.S. is expected to slow to 0.7% this year from 2.6% last year, and growth was forecast to reach 1.2% in 2024. The bank also expects the economies of East Asia and the Pacific, Europe, and Central Asia to improve this year as China gains momentum in its recovery and growth prospects improve in some of the largest economies. However, growth is accepted expected to slow in other regions, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Middle East, and North Africa. And the bank's report warned that emerging market and developing economies, or EMDEs, are facing greater risk of financial crises as a result of rising rates. The sharp rate hike in the U.S. was also pointed out as a significant challenge to EMDEs. The higher interest rates make it more expensive for developing countries to service their loan payments. They also emphasized global cooperation to accelerate the transition to clean energy, mitigate climate change, and provide debt relief to countries in debt distress. And at the national level, the implementation of credible policies to contain inflation and ensure macroeconomic and financial stability are essential as well. All right, guys, we're going to move now on to the latest in the war in Ukraine because uh, thousands are evacuating from risk of flooding following a major dam collapse in the Russian held uh, Herazon region. Um, it is still not clear what caused the dam to collapse because Russia and Ukraine, they're sort of kind of blaming each other. Even Washington came out recently saying that we don't have any, uh, you know, information as to who's really responsible for this. So they're not saying anything. Tell you have the latest on this. Right. Around 40,000 people are at risk and need to be evacuated, according to Deputy Prosecutor General Victoria uh, Litvinova. 17,000 people in Ukraine control territory west of the Dnipro River and 25,000 on the Russian controlled east. Interior Minister Igor Klimenko said about 1,000 people people had been evacuated so far and 24 settlements had been flooded. President Volodymyr Zelensky projected 80 towns and villages may be flooded after uh, the destruction of the dam, which he blamed on Russia. Water continues to surge down the Dnipro River and is set to pose a catastrophic flooding risk to the city of Kherson. Officials at Ukraine's state-owned hydropower plants warned that the peak of a water spill downstream from the emptying reservoir was expected on Wednesday morning local time. So it's around 12 uh, to 1230 noon mm-hmm. uh, in, in Kiyu right now. And so it's it's probably the water probably is uh, peaking and it is things will be quite disastrous yeah, by yeah. now. Uh, it said uh, this would be followed by a period of stabilization, though, uh, with the water expected to rapidly recede in four to five days. Uh, but there are major concerns about the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Europe's largest, which uses the reservoir water for cooling. The IAEA, however, reassured that the situation there is set to be under control and there is no immediate nuclear safety risk for the plant. It's not yet clear what caused the breach in the dam in the early hours of Tuesday, but Ukraine's military intelligence has accused Russia of deliberately blowing it up. According to BBC as well as The Guardian, this seems quite plausible as Moscow may have featured a feared uh, that Ukrainian forces would use the road over the dam to advance into Russian-held territory as part of their counter-offensive. Uh, for Russia, 
anxious to defend the conquered territory in southern Ukraine, the dam has uh, presented an obvious problem. Yeah, one of the things that I believe uh, Zelensky, President Zelensky said was that, I mean, the dam was in the control of Russia and the way that it's uh, broken is only could have been done inside and not from the outside, which is what it is. But again, uh, we're still not sure what actually happened. We'll hopefully get the information on that. Uh, finally, finishing things off here today, a bipartisan Korea caucus. Uh, this has been launched by the U.S. Senate. Uh, this to mark the 70th anniversary of the South Korea-U.S. alliance. Uh, Hedgeong, round this out here. You have more information on this. Right. The U.S. Senate announced the organization of the U.S. Senate Korea Caucus. Back in 2003, the House of Representatives formed a Korea Caucus, and it is the first time for the Senate to do so. Democrat Senator John Ossoff announced today the formation of the U.S. Senate Korean Caucus, which includes Democrat Senators Brian Schott, Todd Young and Republican Senator Dan Sullivan, who have gathered to strengthen the U.S. alliance with Korea and to advance the two countries' relationship on a bipartisan ba basis. Senator John Ossoff mentioned that he has traveled to South Korea twice, which gave him a chance to lead the advancement of the U.S.-South Korea relations. He has brought together Democrats and Republicans, and he is the U.S. Senator of Georgia, which is home to a dedicated Hyundai electric vehicle plant and battery factories for SK and LG. The senators have also added that although there are growing threats from China and North Korea, the U.S.-South Korea relationship is secure and strong, and the Korean caucus will develop strategies to promote mutual security, stabilize the Indo-Pacific region, and that South Korea is one of the American one of America's most important allies, which share democratic values. Republican Senator Dan Sullivan added that he looks forward to working to build an even stronger and more patriotic relationship with Korea, celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Rock U.S. alliance. All right, there you have it, guys. As always, thank you very much for your reports today. Have a safe one, and we'll see you guys again. Thank you. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.